Welcome to the Eat for Endurance podcast. My name is Claire Shorenstein, and I am a board-certified sports dietitian and endurance athlete. I provide virtual nutrition services through my private practice, Eat for Endurance, and I host this podcast because I love sharing the nutrition stories of both professional and recreational athletes, and I also enjoy teaming up with my sports dietitian colleagues to discuss a variety of important nutrition topics. I have episode 99 for you all today, and we're doing a deeper dive into relative energy deficiency in sport, also known as REDS, with sports dietitian, eating disorder specialist, and REDS expert, Becca McConville. Becca wrote the book, Finding Your Sweet Spot, How to Avoid REDS, and offers a REDS-informed provider certification program, which I took and loved earlier this year. Ever since, I've been eager to get her on the podcast because she does such an amazing job of translating the science into to digestible information that everyone can understand. Even if you are familiar with REDS already, you heard my other two podcasts on it, you will really want to to listen to this episode because Becca just has this way of explaining things that really lands. Also, we're highlighting some slightly lesser known health and performance consequences of chronic underfueling and REDS that may not be on your radar. We're really going deep on some of the other body systems that I haven't discussed on here before. So I really hope you enjoy this interview as much as I did. I promise you do not want to miss this one. Here's my chat about low energy availability and REDS with Sports RD, Becca McConville. Becca, welcome to the Eat for Endurance podcast. I am so happy you're here. I've been wanting to get you on the show forever, and I finally got oh. my act together to ask you to come on. So <laughs> welcome. Glad you're here. Thanks for having me. I'm honored. Yeah. Um, so before we dive into today's topic, whenever I'm talking with my fellow sports dietitians, I always like to give a little background. So just on you as a dietitian and, an, and athlete, and I think it would be helpful also to hear you know, what kind of prompted you to specialize in, um, in REDS. Sure. So um, I am a sports RD, as she alluded to, and also an eating disorder specialist and supervisor. Love what I do. Um, my background was actually as a collegiate basketball player, and I joked that I absolutely hated running at that time. And then as soon as I was done, I was like, oh, this isn't so bad when I can do it when I'm instead of being told what to do. So <laughs> Um, And through that journey, like a lot of us athletes, um, I was really kind of striving for what would be that competitive edge. So, you know, if I could get faster, maybe I put in a little bit extra conditioning. Um, If I felt like my body was sore and wasn't recovering, what if I started watching my nutrition in the beginning, it paid off. I could feel the difference, coach notice it, but if a little bit's good, maybe more is better. And then kind of took it a little too far where I started noticing those clusters of symptoms like separate puzzle pieces that were never put together that then I was really tired. I started missing my cycles. I had a bone injury, um, actually a rib fracture that wasn't healing um, properly. I mean, just lots of different things that nobody kind of put together and explored the reason why. But of course, at that point, I mean, female athlete triad wasn't even something that anybody recognized. So fast forward into my career and I always was very interested in performance nutrition, but it was hard to find jobs in this area and started getting some consultant roles and then eventually was approached about order, um, working at an eating disorder clinic, which was kind of funny because I was like, I am never working with eating disorders. And now that's, I can't imagine my life without doing that work. And when they approached me about joining this practice, they said, you know, we could see you being a dietitian that a sports dietitian that specializes in working with eating disorders. And I was like, well, but I got to pay my bills. But truth be told, I didn't realize like how rampant, unfortunately, that is through sport. Um, And so from there, really dove into specializing in that. That's where through my own curiosity, what does underfueling do to the female athlete? And then that evolved into what is now known as REDS. And I just felt like from my own learning style, I like to make things in a lot of analogies. I like to make things relatable. And so that's how I taught myself about REDS. And then I would start teaching that to my clients and I could see the light bulb go off where they were starting to understand what that was. And that's then what led me to write my book about over five years ago. Yeah. I mean, and that's exactly, I mean, I've covered this topic twice now in the podcast, but you have such a different perspective and a way of teaching. And we're going to go into 
I think a little deeper into certain parts of reds that I haven't covered before. Um, but also just, I just want you to share some of those analogies with my listeners, because, you know, I took your course, I absolutely adored your course as a provider <laughs> and, um, and just hearing you speak about, you know, like translating the science and the various guidelines into really digestible information that I think everyone can understand, not just, you know, me as a dietitian, but anybody, anybody you're talking to. So, um, so yeah, today's topic, let's get into it. Low energy availability and of course, reds are relative energy deficiency in sport, or we can say inactive people, because as you know, you've talked mm -hmm. about many times, as I've talked about many times, it is not just quote unquote athletes. Um, right. There are plenty of people who are just active in whatever way, shape or form, um, who intentionally or unintentionally are um, under fueling, right? So um so yeah, one of the one of the analogies that you use frequently to talk about energy availability is with money and a bank, and I think it's I think it's so helpful to understanding energy needs and also why energy balance should not be the goal, as you've talked about, mm -hmm. right? It shouldn't be a goal for anyone, and especially not active people. So could you walk my audience through that analogy? Would love to. Yeah, I always try to think of something that's neutral that we don't have a lot of kind of emotional tie to that people be like, oh, okay, when you put it in that way, then I can understand and relate. So when we think about REDS and low energy availability, I always talk about everything that we do is a withdrawal from our money account. Sitting here visiting requires energy, doing our activities, using our brain. And so we have to match the deposits to those withdrawals to keep an energy balance. But the problem is we can't predict when there might be a training adaptation that's happening. Well, we kind of, right? If we're, if we're following a training block, we know what we're desired from there. We don't know when our body might be fighting off uh, some sort of virus or right now falls coming in. And so there's allergies out the yin yang that people are probably requiring a little bit more energy. And so you don't want to keep that bank balance like most of us at zero. We want to have some energy available just in case and that helps with your brain and your body having a trust process where if we're always kind of dipping into the negative, you'll start to see this feedback, like negative pattern that happens where things start to downregulate. And I think that's probably what we're going to talk about a lot today. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and just, you know, to make it really clear, like the energy balance is that whole like calories in calories out. Like, oh, if you have to, if you're trying to maintain your weight, like that's what you got to do. And it's like, yeah, that's not a good <laughs> No. Um, um, okay. And in terms of like, I think it might be helpful just to use that same analogy. Um, I know it's something you talked about in, in your course, but like clawing your way back to health using that analogy, it's not so simple, right? Can you kind of just briefly touch on that? Yep. So I kind of call it the runway, right? So depending on how chronic that energy um, deficit has been. So I kind of, we call it deficiency, but again, using money, I like to think about as the deficit and then how severe it is. So I think that's um, a myth that is starting to get debunked is that it doesn't need to be a, a, a huge amount of gap between what's coming in and what's going out. 250 to 400 calorie difference between what you should be taking and what's going out over five consecutive days will start dysfunction. And the hypothesis behind that is that's usually the amount of glycogen that's stored in our liver and the liver is the primary fuel source for our brain. So when the brain starts to be like, oh, alert, we're starting to be running low on energy, where can we downregulate? So as that runway gets longer, we've got more room that we have to make up that deficit. And then the, the starker the deficit, that obviously means that's even more. And so I kind of view that as like interest on a loan. When we take out money for a loan, we have to pay off the interest. Then we get into the actual loan. And so, so many people are like, well, if I just get up to my energy needs, then I'll get into balance. No, now we've got to pay back that interest because something's been paying the bills and has suffered at that expense and that needs to heal and recover as well. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And you kind of alluded to um, when you mentioned that five days, the whole like acute versus chronic reds, mm -hmm. you know, people don't necessarily distinguish between the two. Um, so that is an important, you know, distinction to make. Um, can you define so that that's the five days, and we can see kind of some dysfunction there. Chronic, how would you kind of define that anything beyond there? Or how are you defining chronic reds typically? 
That's a good question. I don't think that's one that has necessarily been defined. So it could be somebody that kind of has a small deficit, but it's stacked weeks and months at a time. It can also be somebody that goes through a calendar year and when training starts to increase, they don't match their nutrition to it. So they kind of always have this like roller coaster that's going on. So then they're calling their way out of it, but then they kind of never completely get into an energy available state. And so they're always kind of staying in a subtle dysfunction, but those add up over time. That's the person that maybe never had issues with injuries. And then all of a sudden, like, where did these injuries come from? And now I've got this bone stress injury, or now I've got this nickel going on. They probably have been in this slight roller coaster of chronic low energy availability for quite a while. Yeah. Yeah. Um, And that's also kind of, I think it's worth mentioning, you know, when we talk about energy availability, we are also thinking about like within day versus end of day. Right. So, Mm -hmm. um, you know, those are both important terms and important things to think about. Can you kind of touch on that a little bit as well? Right. So, you know, going back to that calories in, calories out, they used to think, okay, as long as you can try to match that by the end of the day, you should be good. We shouldn't see any hormonal dysfunction. But what they learned from a study where they compared runners versus gymnasts and dancers, they had the same caloric intake by the end of the day, but the runners tended to eat more frequently versus gymnasts and dancers would maybe have a breakfast, go a long stretch, then maybe have, you know, a snack and dinner. And they actually found there was more menstrual irregularity in that pattern. They found luteinizing hormone, luteinizing hormone pulse went down and some of those other markers as well. So that's where they come to find, all right, if we go longer stretches, four to five hours without nutrition, then we also are starting to see dysfunction. And it makes sense because at that point, that's another bank analogy I use. If there's not currency coming in, we got to use the savings account. And so that's our liver, our body fat, our adipose tissue and muscle. And the body has to free that up by causing a stressor response, which is fine in very short, free, infrequent situations. But if you're chronically doing that, then there's going to be some sort of repercussion. Yeah. And I mean, two things there. So like, I am always, you know, telling clients like, Hey, we need to try to eat every say three, four hours or something like that. Um, and I mean, that's kind of like the question, well, why? I mean, that's one reason why, right? Uh-huh. Um, yeah. That's one reason why, guys. Um, the other thing is I think important to note is in the context of intermittent fasting and time-restricted feeding, which, yeah, you can't see Becca's face. She's not pleased. <laughs> Um, uh, but yeah, so uh, I feel the same way. It's still very popular. Um, there's a lot of that going on. Um, obviously you and I do not recommend that. Um, but I mean, again, especially in this context, right, we can see how this is not good for the body. It really is not. So I don't know if you want to make any other comments. (laughs) Well, and I always challenge them, like, just like we want our savings account for the, the fun fund, right? We want our savings account for the fun activities that we're doing. We don't want to have to use that just for daily sitting here talking. So that means that's probably less intensity you're going to be able to maintain at practice. You're going to have struggle to comprehend what your coach just told you if you have this lag in energy because you've used your savings account all day. Yeah. Yeah. No, exactly. Um, And I think it's also, you know, another thing to note um, that we talk about sometimes where like, in a day if, as an athlete, especially as an endurance athlete, there will be times where you are in such a deficit in that day that you may not be, able, even if you are eating very frequently or, ad, you know, you, you're trying your best to eat adequately, your needs might be so great that you're not able to hit, you know, that point that you need to, which is, you know, why we're trying to really pay attention to eating enough. So again, not balance, but availability is more than balance, right? And eating enough like on rest days and on easier days and all these other things because of what you're saying. So we're not on this kind of roller coaster, right? And and I hope if there's some sort of researcher that's out there, that's in, I teach that in the course where I really like some of the tactical, the military approaches Mm -hmm. where they're covering this over the full week. We don't know, like, for example, like you said, let's say they have a weekend block that there's a huge amount of calories that have been expended. If they can catch that up on a Monday, Tuesday, when they have a better appetite, they're not as exhausted, then do we still see dysfunction if in the middle of the week, they're able to pull out that deficit? 
And so my athletes have experienced experiment experiments that I can't talk. <laughs> um, I haven't seen that with them. Mm. And they're like, it's so much more doable because then I'm hungry. I'm not doing as much activity. I've got time to prepare food because when mm. they're done training, they might be running their kids off to soccer practice, or they may just want to flop on the couch and watch a movie. So really working with what works best for them and not necessarily fall in those traps. Like you have to match it that day or else, or God forbid we eat more than we expend on a rest day. You know, that might have such negative issues. No, 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 no. That's the time you want to use that, right? Yes. Because you don't have a hole in the bucket. So. Yes, yes, exactly. And and we're not saying also that like you shouldn't be eating on your activity, your hard activity days. It's right. just that yeah. you're trying really hard and there's only so much you might be able to actually do, right? Yes, exactly. Um, yeah. So I, I love that because I'm a big proponent and pushing like, hey, you got to eat more in your rest days and all of that. Um, you know, in talking with, just because we were talking about intermittent fasting, other fad diets and all of that, I think the other thing to kind of really call attention to before we deep dive into some of the top, uh, some of the systems and things I want to highlight, um, carbohydrate availability, because of mm -hmm. course there's so much carb fear, carb phobia. I talk about this all the time on my podcast. Um, but with keto and, you know, all that, you know, low, um, low carb, high fat stuff going on, um, that's just such an important piece of this whole puzzle. And I was hoping you can just kind of say a few words about that for you. Yeah, move on. I was excited to see that really start to take, cause even if somebody has, say, I already get excited. I don't even finish my sentence. <laughs> <laughs> even if somebody has sufficient energy intake, but they don't have enough adequate carbohydrate intake, we still see symptoms of reds. And I wish I need to memorize the authors on the study where they took three groups where they had low energy availability and low carbohydrate, sufficient energy availability and low carbohydrate. And then they did, um, was it low, it was like a keto diet that had sufficient calories and low carbohydrate availability. They were shocked to find out that the bone turnover was actually higher in the group that had the low carbohydrate availability. Yeah. And so that finally brought attention to now what's actually been used in the, the REDS update for that low glucose availability or carbohydrate availability. And the mechanism they believe they're trying to still investigate is we went back to that first savings account, the liver. So if there is a lag in energy coming to the brain, the brain is like, whoop, okay, wait a minute, which things can we conserve quickly? And bone is luxury, right? That's something that we're not going to worry about remodeling if we're in crisis. And so we just start to see that as that brain detects low glucose coming to it. So it's really something to think about when somebody's intermittent fasting and keto that they're not going to feel it now, but down the line, are they going to start having compromised bone density? And nobody wants to be out 12 to 16 weeks with a bone stress injury. Yeah. This is like such a big one. As you know, carbs are, it's just like such a huge topic. No one's eating enough carbs. No. We're constantly <laughs> fighting this fight. <laughs> yes. Um, so yeah. So it's just so important. Yeah. When, as you're saying, when it comes to muscle, hormone, bones, like so many different things. And I think the really big message, which I mean, hopefully if people have a general understanding of reds is that all these things are connected. Like this is impacting all of the systems of the body. Um, and every, and, and as we kind of move through a few of these systems, whatever we have time for today, um, mm -hmm. you know, we'll see how it's not just this one thing. I mean, it's like this whole web of stuff, right? <laughs> so, um, and I have one more question before we kind of get there. Mm -hmm. How do you determine that someone meets the criteria for full blown reds? Just so kind of my listeners have a sense of, you know, there's low energy availability and then there's kind of reds. So is it, kind of look going back to that kind of acute versus chronic or, or what are you looking for? Just so my listeners have a sense of that. Yeah. So a lot of times somebody's come to see me because there's some sort of initial complaint, right? Whether it's fatigue, they have an injury, um, mm -hmm. they haven't been able to progress in their training as they want. And so I'll start with that as kind of the outlier and I'm big on doing a, a timeline kind of narrative assessment. All right. When did yeah. you start to know these symptoms, what things have changed? And then from there, because a lot of times we know there's things kind of coming beneath the surface about three to six months before I kind of plot that and go back. Was there any changes in your work life? Um, was there a stressful time period? Did you also do another race before there? And then 
let that unfold. And so I don't necessarily, I know they have the, the REDS CAT tool where you can actually now use severity of symptoms. I guess my rule is a little bit different in the outpatient setting and the fact that I can kind of define frequency or what their goals are. But if somebody's trying to stratify when they need a physician provider or being pulled from sport, that is a good tool to, to go off yeah. of. But yeah. from there, if I can see that the mismatch of energy contributed to the symptoms, then I kind of use that as my definition to, to as a dietitian for, for REDS. We can sometimes go into looking at those weight changes, but that's been so tricky because yeah. as that metabolic suppression, which we'll talk about later, kicks in, not only do sometimes people not lose weight, I've actually seen where they've had some weight gain. And that's what prompted me to write the book was I had so many athletes coming into me. And by the time I did the assessment, I'm like, you're consuming like 1200 calories, but yet you're expending 2,500 to 3000. Like it's not weight loss that we need to be talking about. Yeah. Um, yeah, let's put a pin on that. Cause I definitely want to get back to that. Cause so <laughs> many people like cannot wrap their heads. Around that one. Yes. And they're just like, I don't understand. Um, and then of course add like, you know, perimenopause and all these other things to it, you know, for, yes. for women. And it's just like mind boggling to people. Um, all right. So I, I think we've done a really a good job kind of just setting the stage here. I just want to kind of throw out some key terms and explain some things. So that's great. Mm -hmm. Um, and I want to get into some of the negative health and performance consequences that of course result from reds from chronic underfueling. And I think, you know, certain things are, are more familiar to people. I think REDS is now a little bit more known. Um, obviously, there's still a lot of people who don't know about it, including physicians and everything. I yeah. recently had to explain to my own doctor what REDS was. <laughs> um, <laughs> she did not know. But, um, but you know, things like, you know, a regular menstrual cycle, loss of period, low testosterone, just to name a couple examples. I think these are things that people more frequently think about. Um, but there are things that people are not as as familiar with even like, like weight gain or, you know, some of the other things we're going to cover. So mm -hmm. I just wanted us to like walk through a few things and we're not going to obviously have time for everything, but, um, sure. I wanted to maybe start, um, actually let's start with, since we, you brought it up with the, with the weight gain thing, let's start there. Can you maybe yeah. dig into that just a little bit more so people understand mm -hmm. why that's happening, how that's happening? Because, again, I think a lot of people were like, that doesn't make sense. How can you only be eating sure. 1,200 calories and be gaining weight? Like, how does that make right. sense? Especially when all the apps are centered around calories yeah. in, calories out. So yep. then it really blows their mind. Yeah. Yep. So I kind of view this as when somebody starts to dip below and they're getting in an energy deficit, you have first responders. And so it's where the body actually starts to kind of increase um, hormones, try to increase hunger. But if you miss that mark and don't pay attention to it, then the second responders come in. And this is where the body's like, all right, we got to start conserving energy. And so from there, digestion may start to slow down. Um, training adaptations may not happen at the rate that you want, meaning like you may feel like your endurance is still not there or the, the speed or explosiveness. And then when we get to the third piece, that's where things start shutting down. And so the body will start to adjust. I kind of call these clusters between our thyroid, um, our iron metabolism and vitamin D. And so thyroid really is kind of the hub for regulating the speed at which our metabolism functions. And so TSH will start to increase. Again, that's that first responder where it's trying to increase to get a responsiveness for bringing more food in. But if it's not met with more fuel, what will happen is then T3 will downregulate the metabolism to make up for that deficit. So I want to say that back because I think a lot of times people get confused with the difference in why they're ordering um, particular thyroid hormones. So TSH in the beginning will go up. And so that is the body's way of trying to make us increase our intake because it's low. If that's not met with increased food intake, then T3 starts to downregulate to go ahead and conserve energy within our body. So if you go into a provider and maybe they don't know about REDS and they see an elevated TSH, they might prescribe thyroid medication. Yep. And now, unfortunately, <laughs> you've sped up a body that's already struggling to keep up with its energy bills and it's actually made things worse. So it's really tricky. Mm -hmm. We saw this a lot. That kind of got brought to light 
um, unfortunately, in the Alberto Salazar case with yes. some of those those runners. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so when T3 starts to downregulate, that's where we see fatigue. We may see changes in people's um, skin and hair. Um, they may even have some coldness to their fingers and toes. Um, and then they'll have these erratic weight patterns that don't make sense to them where either they've uh, stalled in, in weight loss or they've actually gained weight. And that's what I, has been come to term metabolic suppression, where the metabolism is slowed down to conserve energy. Yeah, yeah, and and that's a good segue into thyroid generally, because that was that was on my my list because you know it's so important to distinguish between actual thyroid disease mm -hmm. um, and thyroid suppression that is the result of reds, um, because the symptoms are similar, but the actual cause is not. <laughs> Right. right. But unfortunately, yeah. as you pointed out, you go to a doctor, especially one who's not familiar with any you know, of this stuff, and it's all treated the same with medication. Um, so, um, so yeah. And where, where do I want to go with this? I guess maybe I want to jump back to the, the weight thing for a second before we mm -hmm. continue with thyroid. Um, so, I mean, the way forward, <laughs> which is, I think, so hard for people is to eat more and <laughs> like i'm gaining and, weight and you're asking me to eat more exactly, yeah it really yeah. confuses them so it's again this is where like you know we're trying to teach them something that is it sounds so counterintuitive but you know you explaining the mechanisms is very helpful um and and then yeah so how do you know how do we treat this well it is by fueling more and that's the hardest thing. So for anyone listening who might be kind of struggling with something along these lines, what do you want to say to them? Again, I love my analogy. So that's where I always talk about kind of like that, that fire that's getting ready to go out. And if you, you know, we put these little kindlings on it, we're going to keep a fire, but it's going to be really low. But if we increase and we continue to feed this with nice, good pieces of wood, then that fire is going to take off and it's going to be able to sustain itself. And that's what we're trying to support with the metabolism. And that sometimes I try to have them maybe as hard as it is not focus on the weight, but I would draw this line. I would use the calories in calories out and kind of talk about the myth there. And then I would draw these bubbles that would talk about the different organ systems, digestion, uh, sexual health, immune system, et cetera. And if there's something that really resonated with them, I'll talk about how like, as we're increasing calories, we're filling up this bubble. We're actually having this fuel go to suppress, or excuse me, to enhance our digestive capacity. So then you can break down and absorb more nutrients. And so as they start to feel better from that, that kind of hopefully distracts them for a while from the weight, but then they're kind of surprised when like, oh wait, I'm actually not gaining weight, or they might in the beginning, but then their, their metabolism starts to take off. I have so many athletes and, and active individuals that will, I always prep them. Like when you have your hot flashes at night, I'm going to celebrate. And that means because now their thyroid is trying to actually pick up and get to a normal rate of function. So that means it's also trying to increase the body temperature, core temperature as well. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, let's jump back to thyroid for a minute. I'm going to spend a little more time here. Um, <laughs> yeah, this is one. <laughs> And, and I think, you know, it, it's definitely important to kind of get these labs checked and kind of see what's going on. Um, when people see some irregularities there, whether it's in lab work or um, they're experiencing some of these symptoms, they're going to the, their healthcare provider. Um, what advice do you have to give to them if they're in this situation where... <laughs> You know, they, whether it's, oh, your TSH is high or some of these other things are off and, and medications are being offered, um, what is the what is the better step forward in this kind of situation? Yeah. Oh, man, this is so tough because not only traditional medicine has really such a uh, weight fat phobic approach, so does actually performance nutrition. And yeah. so I usually challenge, especially you knew this from the class, like fine some research that actually has like a weight neutral health focus and it's really hard to find. And so, you know, everything's geared towards the O word that we hate obesity, right? And we don't focus on the malnourishment. And to me, REDS is malnutrition. It's malnutrition on a spectrum. 
So when we look at that, we've had literature on how to treat that for years and years and years. So we need to kind of bridge that gap between the clinicians that have worked in that area and the clinicians that work in rooms. So another common misstep that we see, and this kind of came up on something our listserv, is cholesterol. Mm. Right. So somebody will go in, they'll get a basic panel and they'll be told, oh, no, my cholesterol is off. I need to my doctor told me that I need to increase my fiber, watch my calories, more fruits and vegetables and more activity and cut the sugar. And we're like, what? Like you're training for a marathon. (laughs) You're expending all this energy. Like, I don't think that that's going to solve the answer. So when we go to the mechanism behind the malnourishment or low energy availability, that also bridges that thyroid gap. So as T3 starts to lower, that is actually controlled. Um, Again, you also think about thyroid controls where our energy is coming from. So if T3 starts to downregulate, it actually goes, all right, activate using the savings accounts. So there's a particular esterase called CTEP which controls the conversion of cholesterol and triglycerides into lipoprotein. So before that sounds too complicated, that means your LDL cholesterol. Mm -hmm. So if this down regulates, that actually means that estrate upregulates and frees more cholesterol to be used for energy. So LDL might be elevated, but that's because that's your survival mechanism to provide energy because we've had to increase free fatty acids for energy source. Well, what do they get told? Cut your fat, increase your fiber. And so it actually ends up making that mechanism worse. So that's another example of when there's a misunderstanding of how malnutrition can impact somebody's body. We have to look at the root cause of what's causing that. And obviously there could be genetic pieces of it, but if there's lots of other symptoms that are happening, more than likely that cholesterol is secondary to malnourishment. Yeah. Or, you know, like we were talking about offline, um, which finally prompted me to reach out and schedule this interview (laughs) was about fatty liver. Um, Mm -hmm. and you know, an athlete having fatty liver, which again, it might not be linked necessarily. However, it could be, um, do you want to explain that one as well since we're on the topic? Yeah. Yeah. So again, if you have free fatty acids that are needing to be circulated for energy, that also means that they can be more circulated and, and used within the liver. We also have particular enzymes because of the malnourishment that end up uh, things like amylase that are increasing elevation. And so that actually can become necrotic or, or um, irritated within the liver. And so I think they've moved away. It's not called NASH anymore. It's something Na- else. We always Nash. have to... Yeah, we always have to change the terminology and then I can't keep it straight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But... <laughs> Most people would not even remotely think, oh, my lack of nutrition could be causing my cholesterol or my fatty liver issues. And like we spoke to a couple of times now, they end up actually getting recommendations that pull them in the worst direction they could go. Well, so just to use an example, like I had a, a client who, um, and again, we're still kind of looking into this whole thing, but the the recommendation was very low fat diet. This is an an ultra endurance cyclist. Okay. Very low (laughs) fat diet, you know, cut sugar, potentially go on a medication that makes you malabsorb fat. Um, I'll be good on the bike. (laughs) Oh, Uh, he's not he's not doing that he's not doing that um and he's and and he's he's working with me so it's fine it's fine but you know it's again it's it's important to kind of understand the whole situation there um and it's tricky I mean if you do actually have fatty liver as an athlete which also like happens like obviously athletes have chronic diseases and so again the messaging here is like oh you think you have like you know fatty liver hypertension or high cholesterol think again it's red no no that's not what we're trying to say um we're just saying that sometimes when something doesn't necessarily like you don't want to automatically assume it's exactly what um you know the doc like what what we think it normally is in terms of mainstream like we have to kind of think a little bit outside the box and what actually makes sense here yeah um, you and, know and it's tricky because reds is a diagnosis of exclusion yeah. so i had a uh, very similar mill endurance athlete that his um lipid panel was all in the red 
but he really didn't want to start medication. And I said, okay, before we do that, like, why don't you go talk to your cardiologist, see if they're comfortable with the time span that we can try to improve your energy availability. Let's lower your training. Cause he also had an injury at that time and see if it'll improve. And so we, they actually did a calcium score on him to see where it was as well, um, which is another kind of measure of risk factor. And then that cardiologist did let him, and sure enough, as his nutrition improved, um, eventually, not the three-month mark, but at the six-month mark, he was actually completely within normal limits. Mm-hmm. So that's nice because you had a, a, you had a team that was working together mm-hmm. and empowering that athlete to make that decision within reason. We never want to put them in harm of their health. Sure. But it was kind of like, I could be genetic, but also I strongly believe because you didn't have this before, but you're struggling with reds now that it could be related to the malnutrition. Yeah. Yeah. And in this, this case, I I don't actually think he has reds, so I don't think this is the issue, but let's say, actually, let's say someone who has reds, how long would it take potentially, um, to develop, you know, high cholesterol, um, on your lipid panel or, you know, something like fatty liver, like, is that something mm-hmm. like, how long would that take to develop? Um, it depends on where their baseline numbers are to begin mm-hmm. with, but Let's usually, assume they're normal. yeah. Okay. So usually it's about six months or so. So like Dr. G okay. that Gaudiani that has the book sick enough, I yep. know she's like, it doesn't do any benefit to order those labs more than twice a year because to get significant change, that's how much time yeah. it takes. So I kind of use yeah. that mindset and then do it mm. reverse. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Um, okay. What, let's talk about um, cortisol. We haven't mentioned cortisol yet in this whole discussion yep. of thyroid and weight. I'm going to, I'm going to get to the GI system in a little bit, but before I move there, I want to, yeah, let's do a little bit more on cortisol since that's such like a buzz hormone popular hormone to talk about i did an episode on cortisol um yeah what do you want to say about cortisol yep so like we said in the first responders for you in the within day within day energy balance cortisol helps free up quickly those savings accounts yeah and so it's great it serves its purpose but if it's chronically elevated it's like the deer flee in the woods all the time So eventually, I know people don't like the term adrenal fatigue, but that is kind of what happens where the adrenal glands almost become resistant to it and they don't produce as much cortisol as they did before. So then we have a lag in free energy and with cortisol staying elevated also comes inflammatory markers. So we start to see more of the IgG antibodies that's linked to some of the food intolerances. We start seeing C-reactive protein go up, which means we have more systemic inflammation so that's the other caveat of reds is that it's also inflammatory in nature. So it's, it's interesting that a lot of times athletes are coming to see us because they've cut out foods to decrease their inflammation. But what they don't realize is that's probably made it even worse, just similar to like the cholesterol thing. <laughs> yeah. Our poor yeah. athletes, they're just infiltrated with misinformation everywhere. Good thing they have this podcast. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's so hard though. And I mean, even as a dietitian and all I know, I mean, sometimes I'm just like in this world that we're in, I'm just like, oh, uh-huh. yeah. <laughs> like my head oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we're not laughing at you athletes. I'm with you sometimes. Well, I, yes. I really am. Yes. Um, okay. Let's go to the GI system. Uh, I think it's so rare these days that I get a client who's, you know, an athlete who isn't coming to me with some GI complaint. And again, it's not always red, but, um, there's a lot of underfeeling going on. And I think a lot of the time it can be blamed, um, or can be tied to that. Um, so, you know, GI issues, of course, are very complicated, very multifactorial. There's a lot going on. Um, but, just in this world of like cutting foods out because of allergy allergies, I'll put in quotes, or maybe true <laughs> allergies, but usually allergies and in quotes, intolerances, food sensitivities. Um, everyone's assuming they're having issues because they're eating like the supposed wrong things. And as we right. talked about, like cutting things out, you know, um, maybe you can kind of cover the GI system from from the con or in the context of reds. And and you already kind mm-hmm. of alluded to everything kind of slowing down. Um, but yeah, maybe kind of just Let's let's start with GI issues due to underfilling. Yeah. So it really becomes kind of the chicken or the egg conundrum because training in itself is hard on the gut because it, it pulls away blood flow. 
And then also if we don't have enough fluid coming in, hydration coming in and carbohydrates, then inside in the intestinal walls, that becomes stress. And so I, I, again, I love my visuals. So if you could see me, I have my hands up and we have our fingers that are like the V-Li and the V-Li kind of slow little speed bumps down to maximize absorption. But if a gut is stressed, these get laid down. And so foods do enter in malabsorbed at a different rate than they should be. So it could be either slower or faster. And then that causes us to start experiencing distress, whether it's bloating, pain, um, or infrequency or too much frequency with going to the bathroom. And so the way low energy availability impacts that is a multiple different ways. One, 90% of our serotonin is connected from our gut to our brain. So as not only low energy comes in, but also low carbohydrate, that means we actually have less serotonin being produced in the brain. And so we start getting a more anxious, stressed gut that's not conducive for digestion. Then when we start adding in the fact that the body is trying to get as much energy out of the food as possible, it starts slowing down digestion to maximize absorption. So that starts to impact our hunger. You might feel fuller quicker because your digestive tract is empty and slower. And so that starts to disrupt that hunger fullness cue, circadian rhythm as well. Then the third piece is we start to see issues with some of the foods that we're eating that weren't there before. And so Lord knows we can get on any social media platform and they'll tell you all the different foods that you need to cut out. So you start experimenting and cutting out this food and that food. And you, you may actually feel better for a while. But then that continues to contribute to that underfueling because now we've started to cut out foods that were fuel sources as well. So again, as you and I both know, I have such a soft spot for this because they really do get kind of stuck in this vortex of like, how do I get out of here? And yeah. sometimes it really is pushing through some distress with your eating to get to, to better fueling. Oh, and last but not least, we love talking about the gut is down in the towards the end of our intestines and colon we actually produce energy through the byproducts of our fuel so things like glutamine that help control uh, the stressor response in our immune system that will start to go down and so we actually have less energy that's supplied for the colon because we've been taking in less food and less variety as well yeah yeah and one of the things um I forget where I got this quote. I don't know if it was from your course or somewhere else, but you say, if you burn your arm and use the same water and soap you've always used and it hurts, you're not allergic to the soap. And you basically just yes. need to like temporarily limit using that soap. And I, again, I think it's, I love your analogies and it's such a great analogy when the, the gut lining is injured and you need to heal. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, maybe you need to temporarily not eat something or slowly bring it back or whatever it is, but the problem isn't necessarily the food we always blame the right. food it is likely or in many cases the lack of food that you've been eating yeah, right so yeah. um I just thought that was such a great way of talking about it yeah um, I was trying to think about ways yeah. that like all right what would be something similar to that but not in the gut that could be comparable yeah. to it and I was like oh yeah a sunburn or a cut on your arm like totally and our, our gut that. integrity is not too much different yeah yeah. Yeah. Anything else you want to comment on with the gut before we kind of move on from there? Well, and uh, I love, and I'm sure you've read Patrick Wilson's The Athlete Gut. So it's really ironic, the five big things that he thinks that impact athlete guts, hydration, mm -hmm. sleep and stress, adequate mm. fueling, and adequate carbohydrates. And look how many of them are linked to reds, right? So yeah. irritable bowel has... I mean, depending on statistics, anywhere from 60 to 70% overlap in reds. Yeah. So could that have contributed to the underfueling? You bet, or vice versa. And so it's really working with a sports dietitian that can help you come up with a game plan in the beginning, but also towards the end. And one of the things that's so critical is I talk about like, hey, your gut is your highway to being able to sustain performance. So we have to match it from the beginning to the end. And the more that we can train it like a muscle to be able to tolerate. And that's what's been so cool, like with UNT, UTMB and some of these other races where athletes are touting, like I had to keep up with my carbs and I was hitting so mm -hmm. many calories or grams an hour. And I'm like, 
yay now how can we get everybody in mainstream <laughs> to follow that too so yeah. did you see david roche was doing like 120 or 140 grams of carbs an hour yeah up to 500 calories that's like a, a it was ins- tremendous it was gut of steel insane. like yeah, yeah. <laughs> i don't know how he did that that's impressive <laughs> um awesome all right so gi um let's move on to i want to touch on low heart rate because mm-hmm. That's another symptom of reds, um, but it's also something like, oh, well, you're just, are you really fit? And anytime you go to the doctor's office and you have a really low, really low blood pressure, really low heart rate, oh, do you run? Do you, you know, Um, and then it's kind of dismissed, right? So um, can you just say a few words about that? Yeah. So again, I always have a comparison and I use an image of Secretariat. So Secretariat was the greatest thoroughbred and they they can't see the images, but if you look, I'm a big horse person. I got horses behind me. And they decided to actually autopsy secretariat to figure out why he was the most incredible um, racehorse of all times. Well, what they found was his cardiac mass was three and a half times the size of an average thoroughbred. And so we know that when somebody has this incredible athletic fitness, we do have a larger cardiac mass, which will lower the heart rate. So there's tr- truth to that, but there's also a lower heart rate that is a means of conserving energy and has actually lost cardiac mass. And so the way that they um, kind of test for that is imaging, but obviously that's not the most, that's a little bit invasive and expensive, but they'll do what's called the walking test. So if you have a nice, strong cardiac mass, you should be able to get up and walk down the hallway and it can pump lots of blood volume that turn around and goes to the brain. You don't get dizzy, anything. But if it's a heart mass that started, again, use the savings account, which includes our cardiac mass is muscle, then that started to shrivel in size. And then it also doesn't have the nervous system or the the vascular system to pump blood. And so when you get up to walk down the hall, it's like, it's like a little tiny hose that's trying to keep up. And so there's a lag in blood flow. And that's where people will talk about that. Like, whoa, I get really dizzy upon standing or I may feel kind of spotting in my my eyes. Um, that's a sign of like a, a malnourished heart. The other, we talk about all these inner organ crosstalks is estrogen and testosterone are both really powerful, powerful vasodilators in our blood vessel. So when they're low, we actually don't get as much dilation in our blood vessels to turn around and pump blood. So there's Christiana Schulfeld did some really cool work looking at amenorrhea and heart disease in female athletes. And so we're starting, they don't have enough data yet, but they're starting to look at if some of these women that develop heart disease so quickly postmenopausal, if it was actually there to begin with when they had amenorrhea. Hmm. Yeah. Oh, that was super, well, that was super helpful. Thank you for explaining yeah. that. Um, all right. Let's talk about the brain now, because I think a lot of people talk about how happy they're going to be when they get to their goal weight or do they lose five pounds and this. And I mean, obviously, you know, that losing weight doesn't in itself doesn't bring happiness. Um, yes. And actually, if someone's experiencing reds, whether or not they lose weight, because we know that weight is not something that's tied to reds. Um, but their brain function and specifically, you know, their moods, like you're going to be impacted psychologically, you might feel Mm -hmm. worse, um, mentally speaking. So can you explain why this is and kind of what to look out for? Yeah. So we have to have fuel to feel our nutrition is broken down into neurotransmitters and neurotransmitters are the things that create our mood. And so as somebody starts to become under fuel, they may notice that they seem more disinterested and they seem more flat, or they may even be more agitated. I was joking with somebody this morning. Oh, um, I can't remember. So we were talking about something with like fasting. And I was like, oh yeah, I don't do that because I can tell I get irritable really quick if I go too long without eating and you just don't want that. So you've got that mechanism. The other piece is that, you know, our brain is what controls circadian rhythm. So that's when we should feel a spike in energy. That's when we should feel a drop. We should get ready for bed. So if it starts lacking some of those neurotransmitters that help us get into what's called the GABA cycle, then we start to find like, I'm physically exhausted, but I can't get to sleep or I can't stay asleep. Or I'm finding that all of a sudden I may have a spike of energy and I feel like I'm bouncing off the walls, but then all of a sudden I can't get off the couch. The nervous system is starting to feel 
the impacts of the under fueling and is trying to, again, kind of give that hyper responsiveness. But if there's no reaction, then that down regulation. And that's where overtraining syndrome is kind of a word that has been dismissed. But Jack Raglan called it stillness in sport. And I really appreciate that because that's what we see, right, is all of a sudden that athlete's like, oh, I've got, I, I have to go do my training. Or mm-hmm. they feel like their legs are heavy as all get out, but they're pushing their way through. And that's the brain that's trying to speak to the under recovery and under fueling. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for, thanks for pointing that out. Um, yeah. So, I mean, I, there's so much more we can talk about, obviously, like I'm not, co- we're not calling out all the different body systems. Um, I want to spend, you know, a little time on kind of what this timeline for recovery looks like for reds. Um, Before we go there, I mean, is there anything that you really think is we need to call out in terms of the different systems that is worth mentioning? I mean, I know we can't go over everything. <laughs> yeah, I know. I mean, it's too much. <laughs> you, and I could, you and I could talk about this all day, but I've got I know, right? to be in the parking lot waiting on me. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I think one of the things um, kind of we kind of alluded to it with the inflammation in gut, but mm. there and again, I'm not I'm not trying to diagnose anybody. I'm sure not yeah. trying to dismiss what people experience, but like the chronic fatigue and some of these mysterious Um, viruses and illnesses, we need to make sure that, again, just like red blood cell production that requires energy, so does our white blood cells and our immune system. So sometimes an inability or always getting sick right before a race could be related to reds and the body's um, lack of ability to be able to keep up with the immune system. Because if if you're chronically having inflammation, it's having to prioritize its energy towards that. And it can't kind of like thyroid, it can't keep up with the day to day. And that's where we see more immune related conditions and issues. Yeah. And, and again, like when we're looking at busy recreational athletes who are working, maybe they have children, like they're, you know, like, again, we're just thinking about all the things that, that go on, you know, maybe they have like young kids that are in daycare and they're sick. All, I mean, they're just so many yeah. different things. So it's easy to be like, oh, I'm sick all the time because my toddler is sick from school or blah, 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 you know, or I'm tired because my kids are not sleeping or I'm, you know, and that might be part of it, or I'm just really stressed because of all this stuff. And so it, I think it's, it can be hard for, for people who are not elite athletes or not, who don't have this team of like 12 people or whatever. Right. Um, I mean, obviously elite athletes are, are human beings too, but you know, yeah. people who don't have a team supporting them necessarily, it's easy to kind of make excuses about things and kind of write things off and be like, Oh, well, I don't really need to, like, I'm not training for anything or I'm not blah, blah, blah. So um, yeah, it, there are lots of red flags, lots of things to kind of look out for is, is what I'm trying to say. And it's not always as easy as like, oh, it's because of some other thing, you know? So just trying to call attention to it. Yeah. And you bring up a point that I I didn't speak to. And I think is so important is because there, there is expenditure in life, stress, things that demand. And I think that vastly gets overlooked. So many of my athletes only wear their watches when they're running, which is fine. But that means they forget about the fact that cleaning the house and running errands and maybe their work requires that, or even just the mental stress, all of that stuff adds up. So when I assess, I make sure I ask for a 24 hour physical activity recall just as well as their nutrition. And people usually forget like, oh, well, I bike to work, but that doesn't count. It's like so yep. easy. Yep. It's only, mm. it's only 10 minutes or, oh yeah, I walk my dog, but you know, it's like, what, you know, it's only a mile. Just or a two. mile, it's, yep. <laughs> yeah, it's just a mile or two or, oh yeah, you know, so like our gardening or, yeah, there are lots of movement things that, that people don't take into account or maybe they have a really, you know, they're on their feet for their job um, or whatever. So yeah, lots of ways that we are expending energy all the time. <laughs> that we have to Exactly. <laughs> all right. So I know you got to go soon. So let's spend the remaining time on timeline mm-hmm. for recovery from reds. Um, I know this varies greatly depending on the individual and how much of a de- deficit they've, they're in, how long it's been going on, um, et cetera. And of course, that's even assuming that the person is willing to make changes. Um, you know, we haven't really made that distinction between eating disorder versus non eating disorder with reds. Um, so not that someone with eating disorder doesn't really make changes, but it presumably is much harder. Right. Um, but maybe you can give a sense of 
what recovery looks like, the timeline for this process, um, kind of if someone has kind of identified that they are likely, you know, suffering from REDS, um, what's, what are next steps? Mm -hmm. So it goes back to that runway we talked about in the beginning. Yeah. So depending on like how quickly we need to take off, maybe there's, there's some sort of big race that they're trying to, to get to, or maybe they do have a bone stress injury and we're like, time is of the essence because we really got to remodel this bone and get it healed. And so we can't spend time in an energy deficit. So it all depends on medical necessity, if there's any performance specifics that we need to, to try to focus for, and then what does feel doable. Like you said, if it is a mom or dad that's trying to juggle training their kids, career, I'm going to be practical and in, in what's going to be doable from like meal preparation standpoint, the anxiety piece that comes with it, trying to, to navigate, figuring that out. And so we come up with a game plan. And a lot of times too, I let them start out like, all right, what sounds doable to you for now? And then as we get momentum going now, let's see, like, can we start with a little even more energy being added on? Or do you want to consider cutting back on training? I never approach that in the beginning because usually the media like, no, I'm not going to cut my training. But if they realize it gets them that much quicker to yeah. being in a, a better state, then they then they start to, to compromise with you. The other piece goes back to, as we alluded to some of those physical barriers, if digestive uh, or, or if we're having a lot of GI issues, that can slow things down because it, it is uncomfortable. We're trying to get the digestive tract up and going. And so I focus on that first, and then we start working on trying to really increase energy and calories. So lots of dynamics to consider. And I think whether separate of an eating disorder diagnosis or, or disordered eating, I just want all of our athletes to know, and I know you have that any kind of change brings about fear, right? There's so many messages we receive in any given moment that causes us to be confusion, causes us to be confused. And so I just want them to understand if you're fearful of seeing a dietitian because you're worried about starting this process, you are 1000% not alone. And we are going to reassure you of that and meet you where you're at. And then we'll get to go in on the, the runway together. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, you know, and I think there, there are a lot of unknowns and, and there's a lot of, you know, when you're going on this, um, journey of re kind of recovering from stuff, I mean, first you're trying to do all the detective work of like, or we are, but you know, we're in it together of like, what's even going on, you know? And then yeah. especially when you put the GI stuff in there, I think that's always so tough because you're trying, you know, cause it's obviously really uncomfortable and it's really hard for them to physically get food in if they're dealing with all these issues. Right. Right. Do you, do you have any tips or anything like that you want to kind of dive a little deeper in, in terms of like that specific starting point of, trying to increase energy availability when they're actively having all these GI issues? Yeah. So I'll, if there's foods that are tolerable, I'll kind of work with that. The other thing too, and even if they're not on GI issues, they look for what we call like lateral changes. So if there's something they're already consuming that they might be able to switch out that has a little bit more caloric density, that's great because that means that we're not necessarily having to add volume mm. and they're already eating at that time. Then we go back from there and we look at, can we change the frequency? If they're going long stretches, then can we add an afternoon snack in or a bedtime snack? And then the foods that are um, not as hard on the digestive tract. So that carbohydrates get demonized, but that is the nice thing about those that it's a little bit more simple for them to break down than something that's full of fiber or really high protein as well. And so um, kind of looking at that recall, building upon what they already have, and then seeing if there's something that we can switch out. Yeah. And in terms of kind of time frame, I think it's important for people to know, like, like this is not something that happens overnight. It takes a, it can take a really long time to kind of climb out of that. Can you give people a sense of like how long and, and like realistically you can, mm -hmm. it would take to kind of recover fully from, from reds? Yeah, so we kind of have the stages. So for some, it may take three to six months to get corrected out of the energy deficit. But from a hormonal speed, I kind of follow like how injuries are. Yeah. Because we, we view like REDS as a metabolic injury. You've got a full calendar year. That doesn't mean that necessarily you're still having negative impacts. It's just that that, that brain and body 
are going to be really volatile to any change and we don't want anything kind of kicking back and, and slowing down. And so unfortunately that means you got to stay on top of your fueling. You can't be the, the athlete that goes, well, I don't really need to be taking in fueling on my long runs. It's not that far. Yes, you do, because otherwise that brain's going to feel that stress. And then you're going to start to see some of those signs and symptoms pop up. But what's great is I don't have a lot of athletes fight me on that because they start to notice like, gosh, I recover so much quicker. Or it's so nice to be able to go out on my long run and not think about how I'm going to finish the last two miles. Instead, I'm like negative splits and this is great. So it ends up being a meet point. Yeah. <laughs> Awesome. Well, Becca, this is so fantastic. Oh, I, this is, I think my listeners are really going to love this episode and get a lot out of it. So thank you for your time and your expertise. Um, <laughs> where can everyone find you? Shout out your book, your course, yeah. all the things. Yeah. Well, get ready for this. You're going to be actually the first person I've announced this to. Mm. I'm actually revising Finding <sighs> Your Sweet Spot. It's going to be the red solution. So I've already been starting rewriting the, the book. So that's so exciting. <laughs> Can't wait to read it. When it wait, when's that coming out? Uh, I don't know. I'm not putting <laughs> I'm not putting any <laughs> runway on that yet. I've been trying okay, to like okay. write every day. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I'll be sure to send you a, a copy for I review. would love so, that. I'd love that. Yeah. Yeah. So they can find me at BeccaMcConville.com or on Instagram. I'm Rebecca E D um dietitian as well. But thank you for letting me come on and talk about this topic. You know I love it. I know you love it. So yeah. And actually, if if you have like a three more minutes, can I do a few quick yeah. bites questions? Okay. Because I, yeah. I see we have a few more minutes left, actually. I was going <laughs> to skip it, but I was like, actually, maybe we can do it. No, All right. Fine. What is your favorite post-race meal or snack? Are you racing or, or post-exercise, uh, I'll say? Yeah. Uh, I usually try to do one race in the fall, one race in the spring, but um, it all depends on my basketball or my daughter's basketball tournament. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, <laughs> ooh, that's a good one. Ooh, if it's post-race, I love breakfast. Like, go get either pancakes or a big omelet from, like, IHOP or brunch. Yes. Nice. Uh, what has been your worst race nutrition experience? Oh, good Lord. I got this bright idea that I really love peanut butter-filled pretzels, and so I was going to do that because it sat better than gels. I've worked through that. And I, di <laughs> I didn't – I did not bring a handheld water with me. I was like, it's fine. It'll have – they'll have water on the, the, the course. Well, I, it was super hot and I got cotton mouth and I started to chew up those pretzels and choked on them because my mouth was so dry. So I always joke with runners, like, <laughs> make sure you plan these things out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That does not sound fun. No. Pretzels are tough. Um, yes. Biggest cooking catastrophe if you've had one. Oh, I lit the kitchen on fire in experimental foods in college. That's a good one. Yeah. So we were, we, that was part of our final and I didn't realize that somebody had put, so there was like a um, demo kitchen. And yeah. so you had something in front of you and then there was burners to the side, but nobody told us it was left on. So when I went to put out my um, dish and then I sat my, uh, what do you call those things? <laughs> I can't think. Cause I'm, it brings back trauma even just thinking about it. I, I, sat the, the, I sat those over and then all of a sudden the chef and like everybody like back up back and it was smoking and I had lit them on fire setting them off to the side <laughs> oh gosh well I hope that didn't affect your final grade no I think everybody <laughs> laughed so hard and she was honestly upset that somebody had left it on and okay. didn't tell anybody so yeah <laughs> oh lord okay um how do you like your eggs cooked if you eat eggs oh scrambled definitely what is your favorite beverage? Uh, can I can I admit adult beverage? I love coffee. Yeah, I'm, I'm a coffee snob, and then I I actually love bourbon. Awesome. Uh, what are your comfort foods? Brownies. I love a good brownie. It has to be fudgy, and anything my husband cooks on the Traeger, he is really good at that. Awesome. Where are you based, by the way? Where do you guys live? Uh, Kansas City area. Oh, nice. Okay. Uh, what's yeah. your favorite ice cream flavor? Ooh, Moose Tracks. Ooh, yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> All right. Last one. Top three items of gear that are most essential to your active lifestyle. A and D ointment. That's the, that's the key to stopping chafing. Um, <laughs> uh, I love my feature socks. Got to have good socks and AirPods for listening to podcasts while you're out running. 
Yay. Awesome. <laughs> Thanks again, Becca. This is so much fun. Oh, thank you. And good luck with your book. Can't wait to read it whenever it comes out. Oh, I appreciate out. it. All Have right. a good Thanks one. There. That's our show for today. I hope you enjoyed my chat with Becca. It was such a fantastic episode. It was so much valuable information and hopefully you guys have a much better understanding of what REDS is all about, the things to kind of watch out for, things to identify in yourself and your you know, friends, family, training partners, wherever, um, and just to kind of be more aware of just how many things can happen when you are not staying on top of your fueling and why fueling adequately and consistently is just so, so important. If you enjoyed this episode or any of my episodes, please be sure to hit follow or subscribe wherever you listen. If you have a minute to uh, give me a five-star rating and write a review, I would be so appreciative. It really does help. I'm, as always, trying to grow my audience. It can be really hard doing this as uh, one person. Um, So anything you can do to help to share the show would be fantastic. If you're able to uh, share, support me financially, I can't speak anymore. (laughs) I do have a Patreon page. I'd love to see you over there. Patreon members get some great perks, including merch, um, discounts on my digital downloads, and much more. Thank you so much for your support. Please feel free to email me, claire at eatforendurance.com if you have any feedback or questions, topic requests, or of course, to submit a question for my Ask Me Anything episode. I would love to hear from you. All right. Thank you so much. I will see you all next time for episode number 100.